delighted to welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Dettol. This session is presented by Radio Nasha. It's our pleasure to present Word, Inspiration and Story, The Journey of Kevin Kwan. Kevin Kwan in conversation with Shunali Khullar Shroff. Sex and Vanity is Kevin Kwan's latest book following on the sensational success of Crazy Rich Asians and opening up a world of extravagant travel love and deceit, with subtle undertones of the complexities of race and identity. A love affair traversing Capri and the Hamptons, the narrative, a homage to a room with a view, introduces us to the lives of the ultra-rich seeking happiness in excess, Asian classism and snobbery. The best-selling author of China Rich Girlfriend and Rich People Problems dives into his literary journey and the universe of privileged culture and cultures his books represent. In a conversation with author Shunali Khullar Shroff, Kevin Kwan is the author of Crazy Rich Asians, the best-selling novel translated into 40 languages. In 2018, Kwan was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine. His latest novel, Sex and Vanity, is being adapted into a feature film by Sony Pictures. Shanali Khuller Shroff is the best selling author of Love in the Time of Affluenza and Battle Him of a Bewildered Mother. She writes on travel, modern Indian life, culture, and feminism for a host of publications. Ladies and gentlemen, Word, Inspiration, and Story The Journey of Kevin Kwan. Kevin Kwan in conversation with Shanali Khuller Shroff. Well, I wish we were doing this in person in Jaipur. Uh, that would have been spectacular. And I know you like Rajasthan, so even more so. Uh, it's a pity Absolutely. that we're doing it virtually. Uh, but God willing, with your next book, we could be doing this in Jaipur. We could be having tea, you know, at the city palace. I know. <laughs> and and oh, having a conversation. How's that? I know. Well, so let's hope, let's hope that happens soon enough and we can put this pandemic behind us. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you. As always, there's so much to talk to you about. So I will dive right in. Please. Uh, I think the introduction was great because it took away a lot of the things I was going to say about you, <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to start by asking you was, uh, one of the publications reviewed your, while reviewing your book, described it as a, a delectable comedy of manners. Uh, the literary equivalent of white truffle and caviar pizza. I think that's a great line. Uh, personally, your book, I found it to be my great escape uh, and it wasn't all frivolous, despite all the humor and the destination weddings and the trip to Capri and uh, Hamptons it was infused with. I think it was very nuanced. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, exploration of, uh, class hierarchies, uh, you know, racism, and people's identities. So, uh, you know, congratulations for writing yet another fantastic book. So my first Thank question you. to you, Kevin, is that why uh, did you decide to pay an homage to A Room with a View? Uh, what made that book special for you? Well, I think a lot of times when you read books as a teenager, it has an um, um, indelible impact on you. And this was one of those books for me. You know, it was a book I read, I was probably 15 or 16 years old. And it really fell, made me fall in love with Italy from afar. Mm. And it mm. was also, I think, such a perceptive book that was ahead of its time. You know, he was really chronicling the life of a, a, of a young girl in 1908 that was straddling really two time periods. You know, she was born of the Edwardian age, right. coming of age in this quote unquote modern world of, you know, the industrialization and then right. London and England, but she was really trapped by all these Victorian mores, you know? Right. And so there was something about that that I could really identify with, having grown up also in a post-colonial culture in Singapore. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know, how can I reinvent this story? that I love so much, you know, and, I, and how can I find a good, good excuse to go to Italy and write a book? Um, <laughs> so that was really the intention. Of course, I never made it to Italy. I ended up writing the book all in Los Angeles in, a, in the, in, you know, back corner right around here. <laughs> yeah. But um, that was the, the impetus. 
So you put yourself in a lockdown before the lockdown, isn't it? When you were writing I, your book. Yeah, I know. I was on lockdown for about five months, and then I turned in my book in early February. And I thought, okay, now I can travel. Now I can, you know, start to prepare for a big world tour. And then, of course, by the end of February, we were all on lockdown again. So, yes. you know. The well-laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. C'est la vie. <laughs> well, so what I wanted to ask you was that, you know, you call yourself uh, an observer. And we know now that, of course, you are indeed a great observer of class privilege and wealth. Uh, you yourself come from an you know, upper class establishment, old money family of Singapore, uh, where money whispers, as opposed to the, the world that you have spoken about now, where money shouts. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was, can you re recollect that time period in your life when you were growing up in Singapore? And what were your observations then as a young boy of under 11 years of age, uh, that stayed with you? And, and at what stage did you begin to really put some distance between the world that you saw there uh, and the world that was really inside you? That's a lovely question. Thanks for asking it. Um, so something unusual happened to me because I, I left Singapore. You know, my family immigrated to the United States when I was 11 years old. And I think 11 was such an interesting pivotal age because I was old enough to really have a consciousness and an understanding of a lot of the things that, was, that were happening around me. Um, but I think being removed at that age and, and brought to a completely foreign culture, you know, the culture of Texas, um, really allowed me to crystallize all my childhood memories, almost like a piece of amber. So I remember everything. You know, in fact, I was um, chatting with a childhood friend the other night, you know, because um, she's trapped in London in lockdown, I'm trapped in LA in lockdown, we were just chatting. And I remembered what her bedroom looked like. I remember all her toys. I remember her dog. She does not even remember what her dog looked like <laughs> at age 10 years old. And I could describe, you know, I remember, oh, he had a skin infection, they had to shave the dog. And she was just stunned. She's like, how do you remember all this? And I said, you know, I think it's because I left at that age. And then, you know, all those memories were so precious to me that they really crystallized. And I had to very quickly compartmentalize it to fit into American society. And it wasn't until about 20 years later <laughs> that I began to unpack it and, and turned it into the world of, of the Crazy Rich Asian trilogy. So I came the full contrast, circle. The contrast between an American life uh, and the life that you had led and seen in Singapore, that brought out the satire in it, in, in uh, the, the satirical observations within you, would you say? Definitely. Because, you know, my life in, in the U.S. was so completely different than what went on in the past, but was also still happening in the present, you know, because, you know, I always say, when you're Singaporean, you're always Singaporean, no matter where you go. You can't really escape it. You know, yeah. I, I think a lot of Indians can probably identify with that. So we would have friends and relatives constantly coming to visit and fill us in on the gossip. And then, of course, I would make occasional trips back to Asia. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I would see this world, you know, and this was the world of, 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 the, of the crazy rich. And it was so different from my you know, relatively normal middle class life in the U.S., yeah. you know, yeah. like all the servants, all the chauffeurs, um, you know, it, it seems like every time I saw a relative, they just got richer and richer. <laughs> you know what I mean? the, private, um, the private jets. The yacht. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, something is wrong here. Here I am. <laughs> you know, all these people <laughs> with these crazy lives. Um, and yeah. I think having that distance, you know, not being part of it, really being an outsider, but having mm -hmm. access behind this velvet curtain, allowed me to see, you know, the foibles and, and really the comedy and the absurdity um, of these lives, quite frankly. Your aunt introduced you to literature when you were a small boy in Singapore. Is that right? And That is true, uh, yeah. There is some nightfall connection with, between you and the aunt as well. Yes, That's, you have a very, you have a good memory, yes. Um, you know, <laughs> she was one of these sort of pioneering 
first generation of, of sort of um, college graduates, I think in Singapore, that she went to the National University of Singapore. And um, from what I was told, you know, Napol came and, you know, taught a residency. He did a residency at the National University and, and taught oh. there. So I believe she took some classes from him. I think she also took some classes of Paul Thoreau, you know, so a lot of, you know, oh, wow. renowned writers came through and, and would right. spend, you know, a semester or a year teaching, you know, and um, so she, she did have many, I think, interesting connections with them. And then she became a journalist and a writer herself, you know, and wrote a lot of very interesting pieces. Incidentally, a lot of them for Singapore Tatler, the original oh, exactly. Singapore Tatler, yeah. Um, and she also, you know, one thing I should say, she really instilled in me a love of India, even before I ever visited India. Um, she had spent a lot of time in India. Mm. And um, I think she was touring the great libraries of India because she became a librarian for the National University. And so she okay. had to sort of, you know, she was doing all these fact-finding trips and then learning how, there was you know. Back there. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's... Um, so she really sort of, I think, really instilled in me um, a love of travel and a love of just exploring other cultures. How fantastic. And yeah. does your, I mean, has she read your books? Um, how does she feel about you being this mega successful writer? Well, she has since passed away, but she oh. was able to read my first two books. Oh, she was. And um, yeah, she, and, and then she, the, the last time I saw her really was in Thailand. Um, I, I did the Bangkok, um, I think it was a literary festival there, and mm -hmm. she, she flew up from Singapore and, and met me, and I think she was a bit dubious <laughs> about my venture, you know, oh. um, but then I think coming and seeing me do an event, you know, where real yeah. people actually came and paid money to see me, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think it, it made it real for her at last, you know, and then there was a there was a big event, um, a book event, that big book party that night for me. And she got to meet a lot of my editors from Asia and, um, you know, knew that for the, you know, that I was serious, actually, I think. <laughs> After two books, you know, she finally took it seriously. I know. Exactly. But yeah, she was, you know, she really had such high standards, I have to say, you know, as a writer and a journalist. So I, I think she didn't suffer fools. And she wanted to make sure, I think she was always very worried that I would become a dilettante, you know, oh, yeah. and just dabble in this, dabble in that. And I said, no, I'm, okay. you know, I'm on my third novel now, you know, so it's, um, this is, this is what I'm going to be doing hopefully for the rest of my life. Well, speaking of dabbling in this and that, uh, you have a degree in design from Parsons uh, and photography. So you, you know, you're, you've got design going for you. You're qualified to be a writer. You're qualified to be a photographer. Uh, have you not, uh, I mean, if you could put away your success as a writer, between the three, uh, the, the, between the, the three disciplines, which is the one that's really closest to your heart? You know, it's, it's really hard to choose because when I was in design, I really loved it. You know, I think I loved the collaboration that was in all these projects. You know, I, I produced a lot of coffee table books. For, for the big publishers. And I specialize in, in celebrity books. So for example, I, I did a book for Elizabeth Taylor, the actress mm -hmm. called My Love Affair of Jewelry, which was this amazing book that was all about her amazing, you know, legendary jewelry collection. Um, and that was so much fun to be able to, you know, deal with the photographers, to go into archives mm -hmm. and look up all these amazing pictures of her jewels, to handle her jewels, you know. Oh. And then to work with the writers and the designers. Like, I loved being part of a creative team. And right. I still do. And it's something I miss because, as you know, as you well know, writing is a very solitary it sport. Is. You know, yeah. we, we sit in a corner in a room. We have to have silence. Mm -hmm. You can't do it socially. No. Um, so I do love getting lost in a story. You know, I love hmm. the sort of, that sort of hallucinatory aspect hmm. of when you spend hours and it seems like just minutes you know, right. when you're finding a story. Um, right. And then of course, the other part of me as a photographer, you know, I did a lot of um, travel-based work. So I would do these projects that were based all around the world, you know. So one of my projects oh. is called Night Gardens, for example. So I would photograph um, botanical gardens in the middle of the night in Norway, in Thailand, in the Caribbean. That's so interesting. Yeah. 
So a lot of my work involved, you know, sort of traveling and, 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 and you know, working that muscle. So I, it's really hard to say, I, you know, which one I love the most. You know, I'm grateful to have had success in all three. And I'm very grateful for what my books have been able to do. Um, but don't ask me. I had, I had absolutely no idea that you have this background. And uh, I mean, I, yeah. I, I knew that you had briefly worked in publishing, but I didn't know it was this. And it's very interesting, a very different sort of uh, life from what you're doing now, a different sort yeah. of work from what you're doing now. It wasn't very brief, Shunali. It was 15 years in publishing. Oh, is that right? <laughs> you know, you just look yeah. so young, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. you, if, you like Google, if you ask Google, if you ask Google, Google claims I'm 68 years old, which I can assure you I'm is not. Is that right? <laughs> it, it must be the Chinese herbs. <laughs> They're keeping you very young, then. It's the acupuncture, exactly. <laughs> or the gua sha. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> so speaking of publishing, um, was it easy for you to get your? Uh, first book, Crazy Rich Asians, published. I know that you wrote it uh, at a very difficult time in your life mm -hmm. uh, as uh, an escape route from dealing with your father's illness uh, while you were with him. Uh, and you, know, you wrote it between flights and airports and doctor's visits and what have you. But once the manuscript was ready and you had this reaction from your friends who said they really enjoyed it and they saw a promise in that, uh, between that and getting it published, what were your challenges, if any? Well, let me first correct you. Um, I didn't show it to any of my friends. No one knew this was happening until oh. I actually had a publishing deal. And then I, at that point, I told my friends and they were sort of stunned. They were like, what? You wrote a book? <laughs> you know, they, were, they were all kind of surprised. Um, I have to say I was, so having a background in publishing, you know, Crazy Rich Asians is not actually my first book. Um, it is my third, it's my th one, two, it's my fourth published project. Hmm. Um, before this, I'd done nonfiction books. I curated photography books. Right. Um, I wrote a book about luck. Um, so I had, a you know, those early projects, um, I had the same struggle as so many writers, as so many other writers do, you know, pounding on the pavement, calling up agents, you know, praying they'll take your book. And, and sell it. So I, I went through all that boot camp, I have to say. Mm. And um, that was about five years, you know, of, of toiling. And oh, yes, absolutely. And then with Crazy Rich Asians, this was a book I never expected to get published. I never wanted to be, to, it to be published. Mm. You know, I was doing this really as a personal project for me mm. um, to really remember, to sort of write down the memories before they faded, you know, mm. and... Um, my father was very sick at the time, and I would be driving him to his, you know, radiation or chemotherapy oh. appointments. And, and just, I would just very subtly just ask him stories as we drove, as we sat in traffic. And, and, oh. and he would tell me these things. And I wanted to get a lot of it down on paper, you know. Oh. But I never had any intention of, um, of, of having it published. And then one day... Fast forward a year, you know, I've been working on the book now, and he had, he had since passed away. I was in Chicago. Um, at, at this point, I was producing a book for Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. um, oh. So I produced the big book on her tele television show. It was just a big commemorative book that encapsulated her 25 years of television. And I was having dinner with the writer of the book, Deborah Davis, oh. who has since become a really dear friend. You know, she's a New York Times bestselling author. Oh. And um, she, you know... We would put in all these hard days, you know, at the Oprah Winfrey studio, going through the archives. And then at night, we were just exhausted. And she asked me over dinner one night, she said, so, so what are you doing? What do you do when you go back to your hotel, hotel room? Do you just collapse? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I told her, you know, actually, I'm, I'm writing just a fun little novel for myself. You know, that's how I'm sort of keeping myself entertained um, during the lull of the project. And she very kindly offered to, to read my book. She's like, well, when you're ready, if you want to read her, you know. And she was one of the most successful writers I knew at that time, you know. So I took her up on it. I sent her some pages at some point. Mm -hmm. And she told me later on, she, you know, she normally dreads getting manuscripts from friends mm -hmm. because she feels obligated to read them. Correct. You know, um, and sure you'll go I'll, through that you know. a lot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So she, you know, I think she felt obligated 
but right. she was very kind, but she had no expectations. Mm. And um, about a week after I sent her my manuscript, she sent an email to me and the subject heading was no. N O O O O O O O. There were like 10 O's. And I was like, you... okay, she hates it. And I clicked open the email and she said, how can you do this to me? I ruined my Thanksgiving. I was supposed to cook for my family, but I couldn't cook because all I could do was read your manuscript. And you're not done because at this point, the book was only 70% done. And she's like, you've left me on a cliffhanger. You know, we are at Colin Araminta's wedding. What happens? <laughs> you know? And so I called her up and, and she said, Kevin, you are onto something. I've never read about people like this in my life mm. and the way you write about it, you know, the humor, the satire, um, the lavishness. She's like, Kevin, you have to get this published. And I said, no, no one would publish this. I mean, this is just a silly thing I'm doing. And, mm. you know, there's no market for this. No one's interested. Um, and she pretty much forced me. She, she almost like, you know, twisted my arm and made me go seek out an agent. And I very luckily, the first agent I showed it to um, loved it. And she has been my agent ever since. So to make oh, a long okay. story short, um, I got very lucky on my first try, but I, I owe a lot of it to, to my friend Deborah, you know, who really encouraged me to do this from one writer to another. Well, that's, that's great. And I mean, you did go through your struggle. It's not like it happened overnight. Uh, and your journey as a writer has been very mm -hmm. but long. So, um, well, as long as you have this legacy behind you, uh, one of your actors is meant to have said, uh, his books have made us feel anchored and seen. Um, dear, sit back and take it all in that an entire race, an entire community, a, a large section of human population says that he has made us heard and seen. Does it hit you about, I mean, for, aside from the success and the fame and the recognition, this aspect of it? It's, it's very surreal. It's, it's really like having an out-of-body experience mm. because I, I, I feel like, you know, in many ways, I just, I sat in a corner, I wrote a book. <laughs> That's all I did, you know? But somehow it resonated, and I'm, and I'm so grateful it has. But it's it's a bit much. It's a bit intense at times, you know. Um, especially when I'm doing book events, and and people will approach me, and they'll bring their children up to me, and they'll start crying. You know, it's people have a lot very emotional reaction mm. to the books, and I think also to the books together with the movie dovetailed yeah. into a cultural moment. Um, that is especially meaningful for Asian Americans, I feel, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and Asians around the world who do not live in Asia, you know, right. who have not felt seen. Um, yeah. and, and, and so I'm just so grateful that I was somehow part of, you know, part of the catalyst for this. But I always say, I think it was timing. You know, I think my book just slotted in at the right time. It really could have been any book. Um, oh, that's just you know, that explored now. You know, but I really, I think so much is luck and timing, quite frankly, because I had I done yeah. this book 15 years ago, uh, yeah. who knows, you know, it really had to happen after, you know, the, the Oscars so white movement, you know, yeah. after people had seen um, and, 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 and felt like this is enough is enough, you know, we need right. to be heard. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a movement that's continuing now, you know, especially there's been so much violence in the last year towards some yeah. Asians in America. Right. Um, it's really, really quite startling, the number of elderly people who have been injured and killed, you know, just in the past two weeks. Yeah. Um, but you said, right? Even in the past two weeks? Oh, yes, absolutely. Ab it's intensified in the past two weeks. I think there have been something like four deaths. Um, it really of began Asians? two weeks ago. Of yes. Of yeah. You know, it began two weeks ago when, when just, I think, a 78-year-old man, I'm getting all the facts wrong, but he was a, you know, a, a Thai American, and um, someone just pushed him off the road, and he hit his head, and, 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 you know, that was it. And then there were several other incidences, you know, of a lot of attacks on elderly people, elderly so Asians. Um, but along with that, you know, there's a lot of, have been a lot of hate speech and a lot of um, attacking, verbal attacking of... Um, of just ordinary Asian Americans. And I think this is, 
you know, there's so much pent up after the last four years, <laughs> you know, and I think especially the past year of the pandemic yeah. Yeah. that I think the frustration and the anger had to go somewhere and yeah. it's, it's, it's very misguided. So, you know, it's been interesting. I, I feel a responsibility mm. to really represent, mm. you know, but at the same time, it's, it's still um, startling to me that there's that expectation and that I'm actually even part of this, <laughs> you know. You know, uh, uh, speaking of the diversity uh, in the world of publishing, uh, there is a huge racial disparity. It underlines this world. Uh, I'm sure it still does. And that's what I want to talk to you about that. Do you see that changing in a significant way uh, after the commercial success of books like yours? In, in, in the Western world? I think certainly there have been a lot of books that have come out in the past, you know, say five years since Crazy mm -hmm. Rage Asians. It's really mm -hmm. paved the way mm -hmm. for, for a lot of other um, Asian authors, you know, um, Southeast Asian, South Asian, um, and Asian American authors and filmmakers mm -hmm. as well. There was a, a big piece um, in the New York Times this weekend Oh. interviewing, I think, five or six of, of the leading Asian American independent filmmakers today. And, you know, at the beginning, they all mentioned, you know, crazy rich Asians. It really, you know, I think Hollywood, for better or for worse, is a money industry. And right. when they saw the unbelievable success of this small little romantic comedy, you know, which has become, I think, the you know, the, the, the number one grossing romantic comedy in, in 10 years, suddenly, you know, their eyes open wide and it's like, oh, there's potential here, you know? Um, and I really hope it's not just a trend. I really hope it's not just, oh, let's see how much we can milk this cow for, you know? Um, I hope it's, it's, it's positive change because um, along with that, you know, there's been a recent controversy with the Golden Globe Awards over the film Minari, you know, which is a Korean American film about a Korean American mm -hmm. family you know, trying to settle in America. Um, completely produced by Americans, <laughs> starring Korean American oh. actors, and oh. the Golden Globes insist on, 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 you know, considering it a foreign movie. Oh, um, Because, you know, I, I think a certain percentage of the movie takes place um, in Korean language. And that's just baffling and insulting, you know. Because if you look at a movie by Quentin Tarantino, for example, um, Inglourious Bastards, right. um, more than half that movie was not in English. And yet it wasn't considered a foreign movie. Yeah. And here's a movie set in America, filmed in America about Korean Americans. And guess what? It's a foreign movie. So I think there's still a very, very <laughs> tall yeah. mountain to climb. Yeah. And we have to keep climbing it you know, and, and, and chipping away day by day. And more power to people like you. I hope you can keep doing that and others along with you, leading them, showing them the way. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, your, your, your college years. Uh, I believe you were greatly influenced by Joan Didion. Uh, and uh, you actually wanted to consider being even a journalist. Is that right? Because of her? Absolutely. Absolutely. So my, you know, my first degree from the University of Houston was in media studies and, and literature. Mm. And um, she was truly the most influential um, writer for me. You know, I, I read every single book she wrote up till that point. And I think just for me, she redefined journalism. You know, she really was one of the first journalists who really embedded herself into a place, into a culture, you know. Um, her coverage of the whole Haight-Ashbury movement yeah. in the 1960s was just, you know, really a stunning and achievement. Um, and yeah. yeah, and also just the way she wrote, you know, yeah. that surgical precision that was yeah. just so devastating and really cut to the core, um, really yeah. influenced my work. And, and so, you know, when you first begin as a writer, you're an imitator, right? And I would say I, I, I <laughs> very much imitated her style and tried to capture it. And, um, you know, I, I, I wrote for my school, my college newspaper, but I also branched out and was able to actually do some pieces for local press. Like, like essays? Um, 
Um, I would do like that's yeah. I actually yeah. did art criticism. I I would review oh. art shows. I would review movies. Um, I just think. things like that. Yeah, and then after I moved to New York, you know, um, and went to art school, I still really kept one toe in the writing world um, because every now and then I would I would get a interesting offer, you know. So I would I would write for Soma Magazine, for example, is you know a, a West Coast. San Francisco based magazine. And I, I wrote um, on fashion for them. I wrote on travel for them. And so I, I kept that muscle working a little bit here and there um, mm. in a small way, but definitely as far as a journalistic standard goes, she set the standard. Oh, yeah. And the new journalism. And yeah. Absolutely. And I, I have so much admiration for journalists around the world. I think it's one of the most dangerous professions in the world now. I think never before have journalists come under so much attack in yeah. countries all over the world, even in the United States. Um, there has been such a dismissiveness for truth and for fact finding. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't know, part of me wants to just, you know, <laughs> roll up my sleeves and, and get into that business too, in a way. Oh, is that you know? right? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, like I said, you know, my aunt warned that I was a dilettante. I, I really am. There's so many things I still want to do. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, um, Joan Didion was an inspiration, but but so was so is Paul Thoreau. You know, yeah. someone that would go and spend a lot of time in one country and really yeah. embed and 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 do something very investigative yeah. um, and probing and you know inspirational. It's still something I would love to do. When uh, right you know, when when, when in in your writing, you, it does come through your entire social satire. That of course. Um, and we've discussed this before, works of Edith Wharton, Dominic Dunn, Tom Wolfe, uh, you know, they've really sort of influenced your, uh, your satire, style of satire. Of course, some of them tend to get very dark and yours stays, uh, deals with more deeper human emotions in a different way without throwing in murders and those sort of things. At least so far, you haven't gone there. Uh, what is it about satire that, you, uh, that draws you to it as a reader and as a writer both? You know, I think it's a way to tell the truth in a way that is perhaps even more revealing than if you were to just state the obvious. You know, if I were to go to a party, for example, and I was a journalistic reporter covering a party, a social event, you know, I would just state the facts, right? Here was the party, so-and-so was there, she was wearing this, this food was served, you know. As a satirist, you can go so much deeper yeah. into, oh, look, someone changed the place cards. Yeah. And now this person is sitting next to this person and they're hatching up a plot. Yeah. Um, oh, look, there's a, there's a crisis in the kitchen yeah. and the hostess is doing her best to cover it up and pretend that everything's fine. Um, you know, oh, look, why is the oldest son drunk? And why did he bring the new girlfriend <laughs> when... <laughs> <laughs> one knows no one wants to meet her, you know? So there are all these games you can play in satire that I think yeah, yeah. That actually reveal the hidden truths that you yeah. would not be able to do as a strict yeah. journalist when sure. you're just reporting the facts, you know? So for me, it's been, a, it's been a, just a very interesting playground to play with, you know? Yeah. And certainly influenced by Edith Horton and Dominic Dunn and Henry James. Um, Evelyn Waugh is another one who I think was just yeah. a genius genius yeah. you know in terms genius. of how he he balanced you know the gravitas of a story with just the pure absurdity yeah. um, because life is absurd it is you know absurd. people are absurd and we, we have to look at it all under that lens you know if we look at it in a serious way hmm. we don't actually get to the truth i think you know no you're so quite i think it's something i have to say you do very effectively too in Thank your books you. Thanks, Kevin. So, Thanks you know, I feel like I have a better understanding, you know, of, of Indian higher society and the Indian upper classes from reading your books. Oh, thanks. That's very nice of you to say that. Yeah. Speaking of Indian society, uh, do you find any similarities uh, or striking differences between uh, the upper class New York uh, society and you spend some time in India um, and say the high society, the well healed? Uh, set in India? I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, I think I need to spend more time in India. 
But I would say Easy. Indians have more fun, <laughs> first of all. Oh, is that you know, I, I, you know, in my, my brief dabblings of Indian high society, um, first of all, there's much better food. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> there's way more food, you know. Um, I think in New York, it's, it's, everything is plated. You're eating tiny portions, you know. A lot of times in, on the charity circuit, the food is just awful, 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 you know. <laughs> paying a few thousand dollars to sit at a yeah. table and it's for a good cause of course but then the food is inedible yeah. you yeah. know whereas i think Land in india yeah. exactly like i i never went to a single party in india where the food wasn't phenomenal yeah. and then people are very you know it's i think it's cultural you know people are much more open um they're much yeah. more just um there's a give and take you know whereas in in new york a lot of times it's it's there's a strange courtliness to it you know, there's a level of artificial politeness that exists. Whereas yeah. I think um, Asians are just earthier and just more direct, you know. If they don't well, like what you're wearing, they'll is... probably say it to your face. Right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, look, you've put on weight. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You've really exactly. spent time in yeah. India, I can tell. I can tell from how well yeah. you get us and know us. Okay, uh, we have a pop-up here saying time's up. Oh, wow. That was quick. I know. Once again, <laughs> I, we just got started, I feel. but uh, I know. <laughs> oh, my God. This is so I mean, much I'm, fun. It is so much fun chatting with yeah. you. It's actually very edifying chatting with you. Really? Yeah. Thank you. It's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's well, always a pleasure, and, and you ask the best questions. So oh. um, I feel like we could keep going on, but I think we have to stop now, right? So I know. We have to, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin Kwan and Shanali Kulashroff for an engaging conversation. We thank Radio Nasha for presenting the session. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Do stay logged on and continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions specially curated for you.